So that's the kind of, if you like, the, um, the, the sources of structural information that are, um, <coughs> uh, if you like, the, the, um, the raw data, the raw sources of the data that's been determined by people like the structural biologists here who are doing crystallography or NMR or 3 dm and they deposit their structures in this database um, when, they're, when they're ready. Um, but on top of that data, there's a lot of other information layered by other groups that make it even more useful than the raw data. And one of these most important concepts is to look at protein structure, not in terms of the whole structure, but in terms of functional domains. Because in protein structures, um, and this is just one example, this is a paper published in Nature, or, you know, almost 15, years, 15, 16 years ago, um, for the Sybil um, amin amino terminal domain. And this is the kind of representation you often see in papers when you don't know much about the structure. You'll see something like this that shows you know, a bunch of regions identified probably by sequence comparison to other regions that are similar and labeled in some way. There might have been some functional, uh, you know, somebody might have made parts of this protein and shown that it does something. Um, you get something like this as a gene and you get these different features. The three-dimensional structure of this protein when it was determined um, has in fact three three domains for this first part, the N terminal domain. It has this is a domain, it's a four helical bundle. There's another domain here, which is called an EF hand domain. It binds calcium, this is a calcium ion. And then it has a thing called an SH2 domain, which binds phosphorylated tyrosine in, in a cleft here. So these these three domains exist in the same protein, but each individually have different functions. <coughs> So when you're looking at protein sequences, it's often helpful to think about the parts of the sequence, not in terms of the, the whole protein, but in terms of domains. And there are a number of resources to help you, help you to do that. And so um, that will help you uh, look at protein sequences in terms of the domains and what the domains do. And the best place to start with these, at least if you know something about structure, is to look at the resources that classify protein three-dimensional structures as domains. And there are two, I'm just going to introduce these so you're aware. There are, as I say, they can be, um, you, can, you can group proteins into, according to their similarity at different parts of the structural hierarchy, and it helps you to work your way around uh, protein structures. So what do I say here? So there are two major cl structure classification databases that have been developed and that are freely available for you to use on the internet. The first one, and the oldest one, is called SCOP, which stands for Structural Classification of Proteins. It was developed at the MRC lab in Cambridge um, back in the early, mid-90s. They both actually were developed around 94, 95. There's an updated version. SCOP is still under development at Cambridge, but there's a, a kind of spin-off called SCOPE, or SCOPE, which is based at Berkeley in the US, and these two collaborate on this. Um, this one is more up-to-date. It's kept up to date weekly, whereas this one is updated infrequently now. The other one is CATH, which is run out of University College London. And that stands for Class Architecture, Topology, Homology. And, and I'll show you some examples of both. Both of these databases have similar hierarchical representations of protein structure. And I'll take you through both hierarchies in a moment. Um, but they have slightly different philosophies, and so it's actually quite useful to look at both if you're interested in, in protein structures. So they're both they're kind of complementary in some ways. Um, <clears throat> the best way to learn about them is not to listen to me, it's to, uh, well, listen to me now, obviously. Please. You are? Okay. Um, but, you know, offline, when you want to learn more about this, is go and, go and play with them, um, because that's where you learn. So let's talk about SCOP. So SCOP is a classification is of three-dimensional three structural domains. Um, a domain in this SCOP is defined as an independent folding unit. So it's basically a bit of protein that will fold up into a three-dimensional structure stably on its own. And so what they say in SCOP is you will only define a domain if I've seen that domain experimentally on its own somewhere. Um, <clears throat> In, in CATH, they don't make that requirement, so essentially they just look for domains that are um, globular units. They are, they are something that looks like a domain in a protein structure, and it's not necessarily ever been seen independently. 
So they're slightly different philosophy. SCOP has a hierarchy, class, fold, superfamily, family, and I'll illustrate that just with some screenshots from SCOP E. Um, so if you go to SCOP E, you come to this as their homepage, which is not, you know, it's just a bit of text. It's, you have this thing, you have classes at the top. So they classify protein domains into all alpha proteins, all beta proteins, alpha and beta, alpha and beta proteins, with alpha plus beta, multi-domain. They have 11 different classes. So that's the very top of a hierarchy. And what you can do, what well, the idea there at the top of the hierarchy is that they are, um, <clears throat> they, they share same overall secondary structure composition. So they're all helical, they're all beta, um, they're alpha beta in a particular way and so on. Um, this gives you some idea of the numbers. This is the growth over time of the database. So you can see how many uh, entries there are. You can't actually because there's no access here, but never mind. Um, so if we move on, we can go down a level. So I'm down now looking at alpha and beta. That's alpha slash beta. Alpha slash beta means that the alpha and beta sections alternate along the, generally alternate along the sequence. Um, alpha plus beta means typically you have a protein that is a kind of an alpha bit and a beta bit that fold together. So if we look, we can go look at folds. So folds, classes divided into folds. Um, protein of the same scop fold, same share similar arrangements of secondary structure. So they have basic um, topological similarity. So if we drill down, say the first one here, Tim Barrels, you get to superfamily. This is where it gets interesting because at the fold level you get a wide variety of functional, you know, you get convergent evolution on a particular fold. It doesn't necessarily mean the proteins have any kind of functional relationship. Proteins in the same superfamily, they have the same folds, and they're likely to have a common evolutionary ancestor. Again, it doesn't mean they're functionally as similar, but there's a higher probability that they are. So it's kind of more, a bit more interesting from a, when you're interested in protein function. So protein superfamilies. So we can drill down, and you've got all these different superfamilies. They go off the path, how many there are on this one. But there's a lot of them within the Tim Barrel fold class. Oops, gone too far, I think. Where are we? Where have we got to? Superfamilies are divided up. Come in. Um, so when you look, sorry, that's right. Okay, superfamilies, we go to families. So superfamilies are divided into families. So when you look at families, um, it means that the, the uh, Scott family, what it, their definition is that they share around at least 30% sequence identity. So these are proteins that are very similar in sequence. They have a common evolutionary ancestor and the same fold. And if you go down below the family level, um, you get to the domains that make up the family. And the domains are part of individual protein data bank structures. So they may be the whole structure or they may just be part of it. So this is a kind of representation. You get these nice little icons which you can't really see here, which give you an idea of what the structure looks like. And then you can go down to a particular domain and look at the entries, and that gives you more information. And this is saying, well, this is coming from this particular PDB file, and here is the domain in context with the rest of the structure. You can see the domain here is only part of the structure that's deposited in that entry. So you get an idea of the kind of hierarchy, the organizational hierarchy of protein structures. So this is, a, this is an old summary of SCOP, goes from 2009, but it gives you an idea of how this works. You've got in that case, about 96,500 domains in 11 um, classes, just over 1,000 uh, folds, almost 1,700 superfamilies, about 3,000 families. So it gives you an idea. It helps to organize this large group uh, into a, a smaller, more manageable uh, hierarchy. So CATH has a very similar kind of idea to this. Um, it has this extra idea of architecture between class and topology, but it has a much nicer looking interface. You get the idea that interface is a bit 1990s, the previous one, right? It's extremely functional. Don't knock the 90s. A lot of good stuff happened in the 90s, you know. Um, but the internet kind of started, which was a kind of good thing, which we all benefit from now. Um, but uh, at least the World Wide Web started, not the internet. Um, <clears throat> but uh, 
Cath has a much nicer look looking interface. It's been a lot of the technology now, it's using contemporary technology for delivering this information, this complex information to you. And so it's, it's more beautiful to look at. And it has some features in it that are not in, in SCOP. And I'll tell you about one of them. So this is what Cath looks like. Oh, that's a much nicer look, isn't it? Yeah. It'll work on your phone as well, which is great. Okay. Don't try it now. <laughs> it's done with Twitter Bootstrap, which is technology that's really cool at the minute. We use it on our own sites as well. So you can browse, you can search, download. I'm not going to give you a full tour of this. But again, if we go down the, the, the CATH hierarchy, this is again, this is looking at a, at a, at a uh, again, you have your different classes at the top, mainly alpha, mainly beta, alpha, beta. I'm just expanding out the alpha betas. Um, tells you, gives you some nice summary statistics on each of these, the number of folds and superfamilies. You can drill down and now down to Tim Barrow, which is what we were looking at before. Again, we've now got down to the, um, what are we now, super family, family level. So I'll get lost in hierarchies. Where are we? Doesn't really matter. Super family, super family. And then you can go down and look at this and it gives you some nice summary. If you're doing this interactively, these are interactive plots that, that work nicely with you. Um, you get a nice summary. Now this is the kind of uh, one of the unique features of CATH is it has this idea of functional families. So what they've done in the CATH project is they've really drilled down. They say, well, which proteins look similar and have the same function? So they might not be identical proteins, but they have similar function. And they define function, at least for enzymes, in terms of enzyme commission numbers. And so you can really get a detailed picture of the functional, you know, what the function is of individual domains and if you're doing sequence comparison, you find your protein is similar to one of these domains, and you've got this detailed functional information, it gives you more confidence that perhaps your domain is, is doing you know, this function, not that. So again, I can't, I'm not going to take you through a full description of, of CATH, but to give you a, awareness that this exists and is a fantastic resource for understanding protein structure and function. Um, Gene3D is an extension to CATH that takes the domains of known structure and then compares them all at the functional family level to entire genomes. So you pull in sequences that are from that aren't of known structure and are aligned against the uh, the ones of known structure. And so it gives you a way to transfer information potentially from uh, those sequences to the structures. And you can pull those alignments down and look at them, um, or look at them on the website here, their their website. So, all right, comparison of COP and CATH, I've kind of told you some of this as we go along, but just to, they're both useful, so consult them both. SCOP's largely, I didn't say this before, it's largely manually created. It's, it's essentially a brain dump. You know, this guy called Alexei Mertzin, he's this uh, Russian scientist who works at Cambridge, worked in Cambridge now for 30 years, but he, um, he essentially has the entire protein structure universe in his head. He's an amazing character, and he he will look at, a, if you show him, you know, if one of you structural biologists solves a brand new protein structure, you can search databases and see if there's other protein structures like it, but you give it to Mertzin and he will, he will tell you not only what it's like or not like, he will give you a functional classification, it's evolution, he will say, hmm, that beta strand, that third beta strand's got a kink in it, and I've seen that kink in another member of that family, and that kink has this functional consequences, which blah, 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 it's all in his head. And I've watched him do that, I've sat with him while he's done this to something I was working on, it's amazing. Um, he's the only person in the world who can do this, and fortunately his brain has been captured by SCOP, parts of it anyway, which is good, so we get the benefit of that. So it's manually, it's actually I should say, SCOP is behind CATH in terms of updates, and SCOP E is done more automatically precisely because Alexei's getting a bit bored with doing this and uh, it takes time, you know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the domain's only defined it's been seen as a standalone protein and thought to be function independent. It has this early 90s style interface. CATH, on the other hand, it's largely derived automatically. There's some manual intervention, but they, they have very sophisticated computational methods for defining the domains. Um, in fact, they use one of the ones developed from my group. Hey. And to help with that process, it's not the only one. Um, and they, they follow some rules, and then they have some manual editing to sort out the edge cases that things never, you can never do everything automatically with classification. 
In this case, the domain is thought of as an independent folding unit and does not have to be seen as a standalone protein. So the fact you have a domain in cath doesn't mean necessarily that you will see that there are any examples of that on its own in nature, but it is in, it looks like an independently folding unit. And as I say, it has much slicker interface, nice graphics and excellent links to other resources. So if you want to, you can, you can link out from cath very easily to um, Ensemble and other resources. Okay, so I talked about structural classification. There are a couple of other things you should be aware of when you're looking at sequences is that there are, there's a resource called PFAM. Anyone heard of PFAM? You probably used it last week. Did you load a PFAM alignment last week? Um, so PFAM, they, they call things domains which are based purely on sequence comparison. So if they find a region um, of, of a protein sequence that you can see in lots of other proteins, then you can define that as a quotes domain. It doesn't necessarily map exactly to a protein structure domain, but it's, it may have some functional significance in its own right. And Interpro is a collection of databases a bit like PFAM. Um, there's about 15 different databases that have been developed over the years of collections of sequence domains and are gathered together in the Interpro. And you can search these. Again, this is hosted at the European Bioinformatics Institute. You can search it. And one of the nice things, in fact, Interpro includes Cath and SCOP. So it's a way of, at least at the sequence level, so it's a way of uh, getting a single one-stop shop for uh, this kind of information. Okay, what else do I going to say? That's the end of that talk.